Welcome back, comrades, to Utopian Cartography, for another expedition into the unknown regions of the future to discover hope, real hope, beyond the illusions handed down to us by previous generations, that greed is good and war is inevitable, because there will just never be enough to go around. As George Carlin said, it's all bullshit, folks. It's bad for you. I'm your host, Neon Felicity, and I'm here to tell you that we can have a positive future. Our guest on today's voyage is Isis Indria, co-founder of Living Village Culture, a collective of educators and creatives dedicated to bridging art, immersive experience, and activism through event production, education, retreats, and ceremonies. We met a couple years ago when I started working for The Compass, a project of Living Village Culture that curates the philosophy content at Lighting in a Bottle, my favorite conscious festival. In the conversation you're about to hear, we talk about the ritualistic roots of theater, reaching back to sacred rites in the Horus Temple, where the ancients had a more active relationship with their myths, understanding that they manifest in all of our lives, so it's better to be involved in communion with them, rather than merely as a passive recipient, the way commercial culture renders its consumers. We discuss how we're always creating something, and how the act of ritual is a way of intentionally manifesting the beauty we want to see in the world. We talk about the colonization of prayer and how part of the program was to cut us off from our innate power as vessels for the life force of creation. Now we can relearn an authentic relationship with our own thoughts, words, and deeds. We talk about the nature of a decolonized spirituality and how we can conceptualize God as the chaotic structure of the cosmos itself, which is at the same time a unified system and an incomprehensibly diverse matrix of different densifications of the original light that birthed from nothingness in the beginning of time. We are all unique expressions of this singular divine life force woven together in a web that we can commune into to help us align our will with the will of the cosmos so that we may act on behalf of all life and transcend our parochial egotism. We talk about what this esoteric conception of the divine implies about the way we should organize society. She describes some foundational principles for structuring healthy small-scale societies around honoring the voices of everyone involved, where things can still actually get done, through a system of councils based around people's particular pathways within the society, their roles in the communal effort of coexistence. I love the way she describes the central importance of art in creating the imaginative space into which a society can evolve. Now, growing our own food not only nourishes our bodies, but teaches us about our relationship with nature itself. She makes the crucial connection between education reform and our ability to reevaluate our value system, which I believe is the single biggest shift that needs to happen for us to achieve a positive future, where we can all have the opportunity to discover and do the work that is our true purpose in this life. We discuss what reconnecting with our ancient history can teach us about our own divinity and what we need to do to heal our ancestral traumas and create the new perspectives that are necessary for us to achieve real social justice and actually manifest a harmonious world that works for everyone. Finally, we talk about the project of re-inhabiting the village and how our intentional gatherings and the genuine community bonds they facilitate are so monumentally important for us in this time of great transition. We have to learn from indigenous communities how to be part of the ecosystem again, because they still remember. It was only recently that we forgot. Evolution is the key to a utopian society. The only way to utopia is to reform our education system, to allow people's unique, innate, creative intelligence to emerge, and thus manifest a real culture of belonging for us all. So thanks for joining us in this map-making endeavor to envision the path towards a world worth living in. Hi, uh, welcome to Utopian Cartography. Uh, I'm here with visionary curator, transformational experience designer, and decolonial neo-pagan ritual theater director, Isis Indria. Welcome, Isis. Thank you, Neon. Good to be here. So yeah, um, I guess we'll jump into the philosophy of it all in, in a minute, but I guess you want to tell the audience a little bit about yourself and what you do? And how you got into it, why, and yeah, and your your vision for ritual theater and all the things you do. Thank you. Um, my name is Isis Indria, born in Mesa, Arizona, raised on the island of Guam. Uh, I'm currently living in Nevada City. This is the territory of the Nisanan. So I just want to honor all the ancestors here on this land, the Nisanan, and also honor my ancestors, Apu Day, um, my ancestors, or Chamorro ancestors too. Honor your ancestors and just really acknowledge our ancestors first. I have been in quote event production for the last 20 years. Um, what really led me into event production was through journeying with different medicines and psychedelics. I started seeing little fairy beings and gnomes everywhere, particularly when I was working with psilocybin and mushrooms. I was about 17 years old and I started seeing them everywhere and I wanted to learn more and I found my way obviously to the dance floor 
And so I decided I wanted to start. And at the time, I was studying with the power of myth, Joseph Campbell's work and Carl Jung, and really getting into mythology, which to me is the way that I choose to live. And so then I started throwing events called Seely Court, which mm-hmm. was where the fairies and interdimensional beings gather to dance. And if a human enters, they disappear for 100 years. And so I started throwing events for each of the different fairy tribes. So I've seen them. So I wanted to honor them. And then from that, one day, a dear friend who was throwing events called Starseed, Michael Manahan, he came to me and he said, um, would you want to collaborate and do events with me? And then I brought my, my partner Osiris in the end, and we were given this oracle crystal ball. And from this crystal ball, we started learning about oracular being work and how to ask the crystal ball and listen and also receive information and give information on how to produce events. So it's really ritual based. And then from there, we created the Oracle Gatherings, which is a 23 card tarot deck. Um, and each event was a tarot card. And we you know, educate workshops and ritual and classes and theater and music all around that archetype. So the community, it took us 10 years, went through a 10 year journey through the archetypes. And this, again, very inspired by Joseph Campbell and mythology. Mm-hmm. And growing up in Guam too, being told legends as a child and you know different places on the island had a legend associated with it and the trees, the, you know, the Tata Tanos, the Tata Monas and the trees. And I'm still even remembering the legends and the myths, really, you know, they're come, they still are coming alive in me and around me. And so from the work of the Oracle Gatherings, I met E. Mm-hmm. And um, we com- came together around ritual theater. It was actually the King's Chamber was the name of the tarot card. And I remember we became friends through our dear friend La. And I asked her to be segment, mm-hmm. which is like full circle because now we work with segment all the time. You know, it's just interesting how things unfold. Mm-hmm. And that's how our relationship began. And um, we started doing ritual theater. She was doing events in San Francisco too. So we were both doing event production. We were also both Kabbalah students. She was doing more Jewish mysticism. I was doing more Hermetic Kabbalah through one of my teachers, William J. Kiesel. And we came together around ritual theater. And I feel like now it's, you know, it's definitely over 15 years. And we've, not only ritual theater, but really the art of ritual in general and learning how to commune with the mystery, um, this sen- the sentience of creation and the life force of creation that lives in everything human and non-human and learning how to build relationships and expand our awareness on the interdependent web of relations that exists in the web of life. Mm-hmm. And then from there, create really the world, the beauty we want to see in the world which has turned into ritual theater, our serpent path work, living village culture, which is the name of our company that also curates for the compass at lightning in a bottle, which is how we met and connected. Mm -hmm. That really is about conscious education, curation, um, music performance that has a very specific intention and ritual associated to it. And the really learning from our elders and wisdom keepers so that we can give something in a good way or offer something that's on behalf of our time for future generations to come, you know, and then really centered around the fire and the water. You know, the fire and the water are our primary places of learning and community and prayer. And so everything starts with the fire and the water and we grow from that place. Mm-hmm. So there's a very short overview. I hope I answered your question. <laughs> yeah, <Okay>. <laughs> definitely. <laughs> Would you say that the that the ritual theater is a way of promoting the beneficial aspects of ritual itself? Because the, I, I think of art as a magical thing that like puts ideas out into the world and can then therefore shape the world. And so I was curious if the ritual theater was a way of spreading the beneficial aspects that can be gained on a personal level from having a ritual practice and you know connection with the elements in nature and so i was wondering if the theater aspect is like a way of spreading that practice uh, or inspiring people to integrate every ritual practice into mm-hmm. their life it's a great question well the roots of theater is ritual theater yeah. you know some of the first recorded ritual theater productions are particularly in egypt in the horus temple 
And some of the living traditions of ritual theater are a very semi well known examples in Bali, you know. So, ritual theater is very much about connecting into the ceremony, into the ritual, performing a rite on behalf, a rite as an offering on behalf of what's needed in the community or a conversation or communion with an element of nature, a initiation, a rite of passage that is needing to unfold. And really to build that relationship with the spirit world and physical world and commune in that unified field for the offering. So ritual theater is a ritual. And when we oftentimes when the story is revealing herself through us and around us, it's all based on the ritual that is needed for the community and as an offering into consciousness. So some what happens is these moments, these visions will start to arrive. And then when the first spark of inspiration comes up or that spark of imagination, then we go directly to our practice to commune with the spirit of the story. And then the story will start to communicate what is happening in the world, um, what new stories, what old stories do we need to study so that we can consciously create a new story as a gift and offering and a way to make the beauty we want to see in the world. And oftentimes in that, so the ritual begins then. And what often ends up happening is that somebody comes naturally to be the initiate for the story. And then they're willing to perform the, receive the initiation on behalf of the whole. And the key with ritual theater too, is there's no boundary between the performers, which are really the vessels of the archetypes is what we are. And the audience, because everyone's needed for the actual rite to be performed so it's a living embodiment of a ritual happening in the now we're only able the story only reveals herself up to a certain point because the magic comes alive in the unknowingness of the finale ultimately which is the final part of the ceremony and really ritual theater is connected to myths and i you know i love this idea of like a somebody's personal story that becomes an experience, that becomes a myth, that becomes a legend. And something Joseph Campbell really instilled in me is that, you know, myths and legends all come from somewhere. They're living stories that have actually happened. And right now at this great transition and this turning, the time for new stories is so key because they manifest. Where the stories we create in our mind about ourselves, about each other, about the world, we start to make with, living thoughts, words, and deeds. Mm -hmm. And so with ritual theater, it's consciously offering this right to make the beauty we want to see in the world. It's a living experience. And by nature, I feel like it helps those that maybe are finding it for the first time again in this life, because they generally people have come and experienced it another, remember the a sacred relationship or a sacred way to really honor the ancient stories and help create the new ones. Mm -hmm. And it creates this circle of intention and mythology, which is it's one of it's absolutely my favorite thing to do. Mm -hmm. I learned so much. It's one of my greatest teachers. Because mm -hmm. it's like always teaching me in the ritual way of life how to listen, how to pay attention, mm -hmm. become more aware of the information that's showing itself mm -hmm. in the life force that's within everything. Mm -hmm. And so it helps me become more attuned and in communion with myself and the unseen forces and the seen forces around me. And then the relations that unfold from ritual theater have a whole new octave of communication because by nature, through the right of communing for this piece, this offering, these new passages in the brain and consciousness open up because we then become initiated into this group vessel for the story to reveal itself through all of us. It's a constantly living, growing ritual. Right. That's amazing. So it like grounds us as living the story rather than it being out there, culture, mythology being some just a collection of stories that are out there. It helps us to realize that those stories exist through us, you know, where the, the that culture is just this big thing of all of us living out these stories, living out the archetypes. And I feel like corporate pop culture is like designed to make people feel small and insignificant and unimportant because there's these big celebrities up there that they're the, they're the ones who matter, and, you know, and it's like this fraudulent enterprise because it's like creating this thing that's like not based in the 
more organic stories that are based on life and the, the actual patterns in, in nature. So yeah, that's, that's beautiful. What can a ritual practice do for us that just contemplation can't? Because in my you know, Western education, it's like just, you just sit in a desk and think about it and there's not like any practices involved. And so I was wondering, like, I guess you kind of already answered that question as to like the involvement in the ideas and it makes us feel more empowered and more like we matter and that the world like needs us and i feel like that's part of the, the time that we're in is like everyone needs to realize that the world needs us because there's trajectories in place from colonial systems that were set up and that have been playing themselves out and are now kind of at the, like that story has kind of become defunct and so it's like we're, we're trying to figure out how to create a new story it's like colonialism like wiped out all the stories of us being a part of it <laughs> and just like replaced it with this story of you're just a servant of this king of the universe there's this one god and he has this one church and it's a big hierarchy and well i one thought one thing i could offer that i said and i can say a little bit more about is um how i see it is you know we're always creating something we're always moving forward mm -hmm. you know we learn, um, hopefully learn from the past, learn from where we came from, and then that experience helps us in manifesting in a good way. But something I've been taught quite a bit and sort of distill my own format from is from the spark of imagination that becomes the thought. Mm -hmm. That's the first step in manifestation, mm -hmm. contemplation, thought. From thought, there's the word, the deed, the habit, the behavior, you know, the word, the action, the deed, the habit, the behavior that becomes the destiny. So there's this like line of manifestation of creation. And, and ritual, the difference I find from contemplation and ritual, because ritual is performing an act with intention and performing an act with an awareness of the relationship of the human and the non-human world. And then, and also the brings in the art of tending. So we're tending to our thoughts through the art of manifestation. Because, you know, the, the Tibetan Shambhala prophecy talks a lot about how, you know, the world is monomaya, that it's made by the human mind and unmade by the human mind. Of course, with the heart. I'm mean, gonna always acknowledge the heart. I, I kind of see the heart and the mind always working together in that way. We allow it. <laughs> so ritual is performing the act, making the beauty one wants to see in the world with intention in a sacred container and, and creating a sacred environment a, a space for that and then it's a, an art form of communion with the divine because i find you know we do rituals every day like you know there's the, the classic like you know brush your teeth in the morning your, your first glass of water you know there's all the, the habits the things that we do they, they all are can be and are rituals and then there's ritual with intention like when we pour that glass of water Breathe, steal, holy water. Thank you for my life. Thank you for that. What that you are life. That I come from you. You know how you talk to the water. You, you know, there's a lot going on about the emotions of the water. That's a different kind of ritual that manifests in a different way. There's the unconscious drink of the water because you're thirsty, and then there's the conscious drink of the water. The water is life, and water nourishes our system. We come from water. So there's all these various layers of depths which we could travel which will contemplation i find is a tapping into the like web of consciousness yeah. this like field of conversation in a way and this net alex gray talks about Indra's net this net of consciousness where it's there's a weave it's woven and he talks about Indra's net I'll, I'll do my best to explain it but at every point in the weave there's a jewel and it's a multifaceted jewel. And at any point you look at the jewel, you see all the jewels of the web reflected inside of it again and again and again. So it's this holographic universe. So in the realm of contemplation and, you know, the work of emptying the mind, um, we, I find that, at least for myself, I tap into this web of consciousness that is a web of relations. And that in itself is a ritual. And then the act part, when I when I, learning in that place and tapping into this field, the act of the ritual is manifesting consciously a communion, an offering, 
building of a relationship, a dedication, devotion in a sacred way. Mm-hmm. That's how I like to mm-hmm. commune. Right, yeah, that makes sense. That's beautiful. <laughs> and that, that concept of tending to it is, was a, that was a big uh, light bulb for me at, at, at your workshop, at LIB, and the art ritual, because I've, I've heard you refer to the technology of prayer. And it, at first, I didn't quite understand the way in which it could be a technology, but then the, the way that you, I love that line of manifestation that you described, because that's how I think of magic is. A, a way to set things in motion, like it consciously setting in motion manifestation, like of, of like making things happen. And our minds are doing so much subconsciously that I feel like if prayer is able to organize our thoughts around, if, if it's like setting in motion with our subconscious processes towards trying to figure out how to realize some desired goal. And the, because the reason I'm super interested in it is because so much needs to happen right now because so much is under threat, like the ecosystem is collapsing. And, and then, you know, it's kind of become a, a punchline that, you know, politicians, you know, when there's shooting or a natural disaster, some politicians will say, oh, thoughts and prayers. So it's been kind of like a way of not actually doing the things that could help to solve problems. And so I, I was wondering about your thoughts on like, how that happened? Like, was it the church that, you know? Colonized prayer? Mm-hmm. Yes. <laughs> I absolutely feel like the term prayer and the act of prayer has been colonized. Right. And it's confusing people. Right. And taking people away from their own power and their own connection to the divine and a life force of creation. Right. I absolutely think that's what's happening and has been happening. Right. Absolutely. And actually, my really dear friend, Vita Majd mm-hmm. Watson, mm-hmm. we talk a lot about prayer and um at one point i was like Vita, would will you please do a talk on the technology of prayer and she was like okay and then mm-hmm. i remember she went on this incredible multi-year really journey mm-hmm. of studying prayer and has come up with this incredible talk mm-hmm. on the technology of prayer and she did just did 2.0 this year mm-hmm. so i really want to honor her right now and you know say that she's done a lot of actual scientific research on the technology of prayer and so i want to bring her up here now highly recommend checking her out prayer to me because the colonization of prayer and how prayer works i feel like has been part of the programming to essentially steer us away from our own innate relationship to ourselves as vessels for the life force of creation right. to move through us mm-hmm. and ourselves and our connection to the elements of life and the elements of creation and our relation to the sacred and to these benevolent life force energies that are here to be of service with us, you mm-hmm. know? And so prayer kind of, because of what these various religions have done, people hear the term prayer, they're more alternative and they kind of cringe because mm-hmm. naturally. Mm-hmm. And so part of my, Prayer has been to decolonize the term prayer and really help to bring out the true, or, you know, the an authentic relationship with prayer. Because everyone has their own authentic way, but an authentic way of relating to one's own thoughts, words, and deeds, and how that comes into manifestation. Mm-hmm. On that note of decolonizing prayer, I was wondering: is part of the problem monotheism? Because I've been trying to, I've been struggling because I was, I was raised Catholic and went to a Catholic high school and took all these theology classes and, you know, left the faith because I determined that it was an insufficient explanation of, of the world. And then, so I've, I've been wondering recently to what extent it's the, you know, like a Vandana Shiva called it um, monoculture of the mind, the whole idea of like that there's just this, and so I, I call it I call it the you know the king of the cosmos you know jokingly because it's like all the wisdom traditions of the world have all these different archetypes and like honor all the different archetypes, but then it's like Christianity and the Abrahamic monotheisms like there's just this one guy you know with a beard and you know everything has to go through that and so I was wondering if part of the the decolonization of spirituality would be a retreat from this supposition that there's just 
there's different, but there's just one God. But on the other hand, you know, I, like I, I do think of like everything as like the universe as being unified. So like when I think of God and I think about the universe as this like single system that you know is all you know connected to itself. And so I'm like, should I be thinking of that as God? I don't know. I'm just I'm so like torn about this like concept of God because so many people that I respect have more expansive conceptions of it. And so I'm trying to figure out what is the healthiest conception of God. And because part of this the whole utopian cartography project is trying to figure out how we get to a better world. And religion is a major organizing institution and, and a cultural train of thought. And so that's, it seems really important to figure out how to reframe or restructure spiritual practice, you know, on the large scale. And so I'm wondering if it's polytheism or a pantheism or like, how would you characterize a general spiritual ideology that is not colonized by that singular king of the cosmos idea? I'm trying to figure that out because I want to be able to explain to people and, and that's in all these years I'm trying to figure it out. And how do I start a podcast is to talk to people like you about it. <laughs> you seem like you have a very emancipatory conception of spirituality. So I was just curious like how you would characterize that in a way that people can integrate into their own thinking about God and what that is. Well, the way that I see it, the way that works for me, is I see the world is a, there's a cosmological structure to the universe and there's an order and chaos so everything is what joel levy and shall we would refer to as chaotic mm. and from those two principles i love this poem that i once or this phrase that i once heard cabalistic phrases out of nothingness birth this fountain of light and this fountain of light started to densify, become more and more dense. And in its art of densification, still very much light, order and chaos started to form. And then from that, these polarities and emanations, um, diverse expressions of this light densified and densified and densified that became different attributes that thus became elemental, grew into aspects of being and personalities manifested into more dense forms. So I see the way that I relate to God in the various terms, even the Ein Sophia, is this, these emanations, it's very Kabbalistic, these emanations, these expressions and various layers and processes of formation from limitless light into densification mm -hmm. that have archetypes, qualities, attributes, virtues, mm -hmm. vices, mm -hmm. diverse expressions mm -hmm. that are expressions of the divine. Mm -hmm. And that's how I see God. Mm -hmm. And I see in myself that part of my learning and my relationship with what God and the divine means to me is learning these cosmological structures and principles to help me understand myself more and my own connection to the unseen and the seen realms and the divine to thus help me not only see the beauty in the world but create the beauty in the seen world because i don't believe god is outside me i don't believe that i am the messiah either <laughs> but i do believe that there is this potential and this innate wisdom information energy inside of my divine human temple that i chose to be born into in this life at this time for a reason to unlock open up help me gain more access and really connect into the web of consciousness the web of relations so it feels very spider-like where it's you know weaving the world weaving the web and also feels like a part in it where the, in the web itself is this to me this divine consciousness and I'm an aspect in it so I have my own diverse expression of it yet I'm within all of it too so it's both and 
you know, this concept of free will, where, you know, free will comes in, where we have the right to choose how we see things, brings in, you know, perspective. And like Wayne Dyer says, when you change the way you look at things and things you look at change, and how perspective plays a role in how we create the world. What I find for my will is as like a human that is realizing my own divinity as a diverse expression of the divine in connected to this web of diverse expressions of the divine that is all part of one divine web, my personal choices not only affect my perspective in life, but they affect the web itself. Every small act sends a ripple effect into the web. And so part of it is, for me, the learning and really the true realization on the responsibility of that every day deepens and grows. And also to help me become more aware of how to align my will with this group will, that is the will of divine on behalf of all life moving forward. Because everything that I do affects the web of relations and web of life and everything that is happening in the relations and web of life helps me, affects me. So there's this wake up, shake up that's a wake up of the divine human nature that has responsibility to care for and uphold and tend to the web of divinity that is everyone and for everyone, human and non-human, mostly non-human. So when I'm tuning into God, I use that term often, our creator is the term I choose to use the most, or divine, beloved, Sometimes I'm traveling and I hear Allah everywhere. When I'm communing with that life force energy, I feel like I'm communing into the web. That's how I drop into it. And then I see myself as a jewel in the web. And no matter which direction I'm looking, forwards, backwards, diagonal, up, down, circular, any direction I'm looking or tuning into, I'm making offerings. Those are reflected inside of it, this holographic universe. Mm -hmm. And so when I'm praying to the divine with my imagination, my good thoughts, my words, and my deeds, I'm making offerings to help strengthen the web of relations. Because I see that I'm an instrument, I'm a vessel for the life force of creation to move through me gracefully and easily. And so I have to keep tuning this temple, this body here, and this mind and and the heart and all of the organs and I have to keep tending to it, tuning it, taking care of it so that I can really take care of and make good offerings in the web too. Yeah, that's beautiful. Definitely. I feel like that that conception of it goes towards the shift that I see as necessary from a conception of ethics as just what it says in a book versus an actual consideration of the impact of a given thing that we do or say on, as you say, the web of relations, because I've generally been conceptualizing that as um, post-human ethics. It's going to be the last chapter of my book is going to be on how we design and how we conceptualize an ethical framework that is beyond anthropocentrism. It's like the church said that humans don't matter and we're just here to serve Yahweh or whatever, towards the modern era where it's like, oh, humans are the most important thing to, I think, where we are going, where we need to go, is towards a conception of, of that everyone matters, and it's not just humans, and so I really like your description of that, that everything we do and say is a rippling effect through the web, and I also like the general framework of a web, because I think the new paradigm is fundamentally hyper-democratic, and it's less of a hierarchy and more of a network. And so I really love what you said about the jewel at the, at the, at the nose that reflects the rest of the network. I love that. It's a new conception of it. So what do you think that conception of the divine and our relationship with it implies about the way we organize society? Because part of what's organizing our society now is this hierarchy where, you know, God supposedly put some people in charge and that's why they're in charge, as opposed to, like, considering the fact that they just did some conniving shit to get there. So I was wondering, like, what do you think a more post-anthropocentric conception of God and ethics would say about the way we organize our society and set up our 
economy and the civic structures. And a lot of it is so anthropocentric that I've been trying to figure out how the society will be structured such that, because I do think that, that we'll get to a point where, you know, we, we still have human rights crises going on, but I, I think eventually we'll get to a point where animal rights will be much more prominent. And I, mean, I can imagine the time in the not so distant future where we first give citizenship, or not maybe not citizenship, but some legal rights to you know, maybe apes and then dolphins and then, you know, like, and we, you know, yeah. we work our way into the rest of the ecosystem. Mm -hmm. and, I love that. And so I was wondering if you had any thoughts on that. Or... Um, what are some ways to organize a new society? Yeah. Okay. Well, I mean, that's a big question. Yeah. I, you know, I feel like I'm still learning, but I can share how I feel at the moment. Yeah. I'm sure it'll evolve tomorrow and mm -hmm. next week and next month and forever. Yeah. Um, something that I find really interesting is Dom and her. I went with my ex-partner many years ago for an intentional communities conference because mm -hmm. I, for a while I was really studying intentional communities. And, um, there was a couple things about the way they organized their community that I had never heard before. Mm -hmm. I'm sure it's happening elsewhere, but we share these ideas. Well, first off, I feel like societies where everyone actually has a voice by nature are going to need to be smaller. Because mm -hmm. the reality of everyone having a voice being heard, I feel like beyond maybe, I don't really know the statistics, but beyond 600 to 1,000, I feel like it's, it's kind of unrealistic. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Maybe I'm, I could be wrong. I hope I'm wrong, but that's sort of how, that is how I feel about it at this moment. Mm -hmm. So I feel like values and relations, uh, some spiritual connection is key and primary that everyone somewhat agrees upon. Mm -hmm. A way to like come back to the sacred in some fashion mm -hmm. in that particular society is necessary. Whether the term sacred is used, whether the term prayer is used, or spirituality is used, some kind of communion that is beyond the human, that has is based in like respect and integrity and really interdependence, I feel like is a necessary, consistent practice. Um, the other piece that I find, you know, the way that we do just like the sweat lodge or a new moon circle or, you know, oracular rights yearly. We are here the rights. The other thing I find is really interesting and important, and so Dom and her does that. I'll get back to Dom in a second. I'm going to skip, skip over here. Is the, in an ancient Egyptian tradition, it is shared in stories that there were these 42 ideals of Maat, and it was an internal system of checks and balances. And in their stories and in their belief structure, that when the body died and the soul was on its journey into the afterlife to meet Osiris. Their heart, the heart of the soul, was weighed with the feather of justice and harmony of Ma'at on the scale, 10 to 2 by Anubis, and it was weighed against the 42 ideals. And they had a chance for the 42 confessions. And the, the goal is that the heart is lighter than the feather and then the soul passes into the afterlife. If the heart is heavier than the feather, then the soul it's eaten again by the hippopotamus crocodile being and then goes back and has to do new life. Mm -hmm. That to me is really interesting because everyone's raised with these, or then was raised with these 42 ideals, this internal system of checks and balances. Mm -hmm. And with the awareness that when death came or eternal life, this was going to be your quote, mm -hmm. judgment day. Mm -hmm. What it did, it create it, what I believe and what I'm doing my best to follow now mm -hmm. creates this self checking mm -hmm. system that is um, had things like I keep my own counsel, I, I respect the property of others, um, I speak positively of others, mm -hmm. I honor animals with reverence, I keep the waters pure. Mm -hmm. You know, there's 42 of them, and a lot of it is reverence of self, reverence of the group, and resident reverence of the life force of creation. Mm -hmm. Like that, an internal system of checks and balances for self-awareness is key. A group agreement around some sort of connection to the sacred that's human and non-human, that's coming from a place of reverence, respect, integrity, care on behalf of all beings. And then a 
process of decision making where all the voices are included in a way where things can actually get done also. Yeah, that's the challenge. And this is where Dominic comes in. This is something that was really interesting. We haven't quite, quite practiced this yet. I'm looking forward to actually experimenting with this. Yes. From what I understand, the limited amount that I understand at this point, was that their community is divided into, you make a commitment when you're committed to join the community. For two years, you're going to be in service to one of the eight pathways of education, whether it was like a regular pathway or building mm -hmm. or farming or whatever it was. Mm -hmm. You make it to your commitment. Again, this might have changed. This was like 20 years ago. So I'm just going to speak what I remember. And then in that two-year period, you have counsel that's related to that part or that pathway of the society and where everyone counsels. And then I don't know if it was like monthly or bi-monthly, that group chooses a leader. And then all of the leaders of each group come to a council mm -hmm. and they that leader is responsibility to speak on behalf of the group. They counsel about topics to dynamics, et cetera. Simultaneously, there are two people that are always in commit to a six month meditation practice to meditate on behalf of the entire community so that the our form of visions and um, a tune in can that voice can be heard and then the whole community votes okay maybe you know, we need more music in the community let's or we need musical understanding let's we vote that so and so will meditate for six months this musician we also or maybe we need like more of the painter's perspective mm -hmm. so we vote that this painter sits in meditation for six months mm -hmm. so simultaneously there's two people that are committed to meditation every day to then bring the visions from the meditation to the community. Simultaneously, the two-year commitment each person makes to a part of the community, a spoke in the wheel, yeah. pathway in the wheel. They meet with the council of that spoke or pathway in the wheel. Then that council, they all appoint one leader and the leaders come together to council as a group. And then the, the, the next thing they have that that's, I think is really interesting mm -hmm. And I would probably do a little bit differently, but I love this concept. It's related to the art of meditation, ultimately, is they have this oracle clan where they people bring questions to the oracles, and the oracles ask the fire the questions, and they receive information from the fire. So there's this relationship with the elements. Yeah. And a lot of indigenous native traditions, you know, pretty much indigenous to anywhere, they're is a relationship with the elements and the elements communicate. And I feel like that is a really important part of society that we've lost, that communication with the elements of life, mm -hmm. the nature, communion in that way. I feel like that is a very important part of it mm -hmm. in a big way too. And then I also feel that, I mean, I've drawn out my vision of the potential community. So I'm, I'm gonna go back to that. You know, it's been 20 years, but I did it. Yeah. I feel like it's a beautiful concept. So. <laughs> <laughs> and I mean, again, I mean, you know, we're we're diverse species. You know, we're made up of you know the earth and different stars. And so, I feel like different groups are going to have a way that works for them. Mm -hmm. But there are these basic principles that I do feel like are useful mm -hmm. for smaller okay. societies. Right. The other piece I feel like is really important is art as a central focus, the creative, imaginary imaginary exploration of creation so that new pathways in the brain and the perspectives can open mm -hmm. and to do that together so that that can help inspire and thus inform the evolution of the community and i also feel like communities or societies there needs to be a thread of evolution on the spin spoke of the wheel mm -hmm. so it because i don't feel like it can ever just be our society is made up as we follow a b c d and e there's got to be like an F that is unknown, like a place for the unknown and the mystery to communicate so that the evolution process is always open-ended, almost kind of like hand fasts, where like when two people come together, instead of like getting married forever to that deep part, make a commitment for one year, and then you come back that next year, you make a commitment for two, and you come back that next year, then you do four, you double it, then you do eight, then you do 16. So it's like really allowing evolution to be a part of the society's growth pattern mm -hmm. versus having to bump up against a resistance to it. Because mm -hmm. unknown is the center of it all in a way. Mm -hmm. you know, right. all of it. 
big unknowns. I also feel like, and it's a reminder for myself because I haven't done this in a while. I feel like growing food and like building a relationship with soil and plants and like blowing on your seeds and watching your seeds grow the food that nourishes your body and coming together around growing food, I think is a, for various reasons so important. Of course, obviously, because of, you know, you're making the food that you're going to eat. And also the like learning about healthy soil and how healthy soil works on the brain and in the body and in the heart. And then also the really together having these very clear wins where you plant a seed, it grows into this beautiful you know, bok choy, you eat the bok choy, goes back in your body, it's the cycle of life and death, and then also seeing what one small act can do that can nourish the cell and thus nourish the community, and then also that it's changing, there's a changing nature to it, and it's impermanent, yet the permanence is the continued cultivation. You know, mm-hmm. so like it brings in the art of tending and cultivation right. and helps people receive a, a win of some kind, a mm-hmm. nourishment, and thus a feeling of belonging because it's an earth based like, practice. Mm-hmm. I feel like that's a learning that is so key. And, mm-hmm. you know, obviously gratitude, mm-hmm. you know. So those are some ideas. On some, I could go on. I mean, I could literally talk about this for hours. So I hope those are some yes. useful yes. keys to your totally. question. Yeah, definitely. In the form of money, money is an interesting one. Value is an interesting one. Right. Because of what our society has determined, what has a higher value or a lower value. Right. And I feel like something that we probably can all agree on is that we need to reevaluate our value system. Right. And, you know, labor and time and money and energy and mm-hmm. how that all works because everyone's diverse everyone does things a little bit differently our education system obviously has been a programming dynamic and so we're being forced to do things in our true nature and not our purpose work and so we're not able to really come forward with our full energy in a way that feels natural because it's not mm-hmm. you know so there's obviously an entire education reform mm-hmm. at play mm-hmm. that will is necessary for us to reevaluate our value systems right. yeah. to then create an equanimous society that is based in people doing what they're really here to do right. why they chose to be born at this time right. and i believe that as we discover that and do that all the parts and roles that make a society function in a healthy loving really thriving way will be filled right. You know, but part of the journey is discovering our purpose work and feeling the support and the really the worthiness and that there's enough to go around to actually do that. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. as the systems are breaking down, you know, we're building new ones, just like fucking Mr. Fuller talks a lot about. Mm-hmm. You know, but I also feel too that as the systems that we've been programmed to function in are breaking down, so must the programs that we've been function with have to break down and that can sometimes lead to like this gray line around what's sane and insane. Yeah, the mental health crisis in the world. It's It's a big moment for our species. We're in a huge moment. Right. Yeah, I feel like we've been here before, just looked a little bit different. Right. Yeah, totally. (laughs) Those are some of my thoughts on your question. (laughs) Yeah, Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah, because I was going to say, about the disconnection from the process of growing our own food, part of that was the education system. It was like this forced process where they had to train people how to sit in a factory and just like just make one part of a widget over and over and mm-hmm. over and over again all day. And so I feel like we set up a, this education system, which like is what installs you know our primary culture into our minds. It, it, it's obsolete because it was designed for a previous time before we. I don't know, like back when we first started inventing factories and they're like, hey, we need some workers in here. <laughs> but nobody wants to sit still. But. Such a big one. We talk about that one all day. <laughs> right. No? Mm-hmm. Shoot, I have to go. Oh, no. Let me... oh, time flew. Oh, wow. Hold on a second. I could keep talking with you, though. <laughs> Should I just have this call real quick and then see where we're at? Sure. Yeah? Does yeah. that work for you? Mm-hmm. Okay. So, I see a big part of the problem that we're facing now as historical 
amnesia. Like people don't know where we came from, and so they're vulnerable to believing big lies about like who matters and what matters, and you know, like because people don't know what got us here. And so I was wondering your thoughts on like what reconnecting with our ancient past can tell us about the future and how we should go forward because it seems like we're stuck at an impasse because we don't know the long story that we've been evolving from. I mean, I am a huge student of ancient civilizations for the very reason of, you know, I feel like the lack of awareness or understanding of our true history is a big part of how colonization, what it's done and continuing to do. Mm -hmm. Because if we don't know who we really are or where we come from, we don't understand really our own innate intelligence and the, really the depth of pathways in our body and the wisdom and the water in the body and the, all of those things and thus don't know how to move forward in a good way. I really feel like there has been a colonization or, or a plan, a program to basically shut down a lot of passages in the brain and access to the intelligence stored in our DNA and our body systems. And at this time when all of these things are being uncovered, like technologies, or tech, really technologies that have always been there, but we've been colonized to believe that, or understand that there's something different than that they actually are, like the Great Pyramid as an example. As more of a true understanding of these ancient structures and these artifacts and these myths and these stories are really being revealed, Everything we've ever thought we are or who we are or where we come from is changing and going to keep changing. And thus, we're going to learn more about our ancestry that shows us actually really our divinity and helps us gain more access to the innate wisdom and intelligence inside the body to then help us create more passageways and perspectives to thus create the new innovative ways of living and being and technologies for the future. We got to go back into the past to learn, heal, do the ancestral healing that we haven't done, take care of ourselves and our lineage backwards, thus so that moving forward, we're creating a good pathway forward. I feel like so much has so many artifacts and temples and Squirrels like Alexandria have been destroyed on purpose. Mm -hmm. And that has been a primary way to keep us shrouded or cloud and clouded and ignorant. And all of that's changing. I really believe all of that's changing in a way with sort of the all these new tech the technological advancement of this time mm -hmm. is Obviously, there's shadow aspects to it, but the positive aspects to it is it's helping us see things and uncover things that have been hidden, right. consciously hidden, as you know. So this is a really exciting time. Mm -hmm. And with this great unveiling that is happening and this new awareness that is blossoming through the unveiling, thus major transformation, major shadow work, major ancestral healing by nature has to happen. For us to go to the next level and also new innovative perspectives are also birthing because that's what we need imaginative innovative perspectives and artists to help craft the technologies for these new perspectives and artists in every sense of the word i believe everybody is an artist they just have a different kind of art form that they work with um, so that we can create this or, or be part of the unfoldment of what is creating and I feel like we really need to protect the children's imagination, the kids. Like imagination is like of utmost importance. And not only protect, care for, and listen to what the children, the new children are saying, and also do what we can to keep our imagination growing and blossoming and flourishing so that we can thus imagine, think, say, do, create the, our destiny together. Yeah. The beauty we want to see in the world. I love that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's beautiful. And that leads into my next question, which was about your project of Living Village Culture. And I, I was wondering about a thought on how these immersive experiences of community can transform people into more caring, compassionate, conscious members of an emancipatory collective where we're all working together to improve each other's reality. And so I was wondering, like, what is it about community, experiences of community that are so profound 
for people and helping us to rediscover our social roots because we've been trained to think that you know you're just an individual alone in the universe or whatever and everything everybody's separate and so uh, like where does community play in the transition to the new world well i love this like um everyone's unique together there's there's like a u there's a unity in our diversity right. I love that. It's true. Oh, yeah. oh my God, it's amazing. <laughs> Thank God we're not the same. Right. Um, <laughs> Living Village Culture was birthed by Eve and I together with our friend Benja Renako. He, he was the first person to attend the first Living Village Culture fire, so I just like to acknowledge him mm-hmm. that way. Was created out of this, you know, idea that, you know, festival culture is in some way, a conscious or unconscious desire to experience village life in some form in a modern day. You know, I grew up in where I'm from, Guam, every area is referred to as a village. It's multi-generational and familial. And and so in a lot of ways, I feel like my part in our, our duo dynamic is to help create the village that I was raised in in some modern way too. I feel like that's maybe why I was attracted to festival culture too, because it's some unconscious or conscious desire to experience village life. So living village culture is to create a living village culture where it's a way of life. A culture in, in the culture, there is music, art, performance, education, rites, rituals, multi-generational relationships, you know, elders, children, adults, teens, multi-dimensional human and non-human relationships centered around a reverence for the sacredness of life intended to through the educational process that then and, and really to galvanize the activist potential of the people to thus like bridge build networks and really to create a culture of belonging because everyone's included everyone belongs everyone has a place everyone has a spoken wheel their unique diverse quality perspective way of doing things is necessary for the whole and so the, a lot of the work of the compass is to help people find their purpose, that internal compass of where really the, the work that their purpose, what they're here to do, where they thrive, reveals itself to them, and thus find themselves amongst a community that is also doing that. So you feel a part of something, everyone has a role, everyone feels supported because the other roles are tended to and cared for, and there's this feeling of like we're in it together. A lot of our elders and wisdom keepers say over and over again, like, keep gathering, keep gathering, gathering as much as you gather as much as you can. Because mm-hmm. as the like systems that we've been programmed to function in are breaking down, and so does our the programming in our own minds, while we're going through these intense moments of transformation, being together right. is so key so we don't feel isolated, alone, um, sometimes, you know, taken by our traumas or our ancestral healing dynamics that can sometimes take over. Instead, we feel a part of a group that is also on that journey together and has, everyone has a different piece of, a different way to share that can help inspire and or support. And then also um, with a commitment to, you know, healing, a commitment to healing so that we can then really be part of the ecosystem again. Because, you know, humans were always part of the ecosystem. It's only recently that we haven't been, you know, in the spectrum of all the species. But many times that we have lived here and some survived the floods and then we populated. Like, a lot of the ancient species has happened many times. Mm-hmm. And we're, I feel like, at the youngest we've ever been as a species. And a lot of these indigenous communities and frontline communities really are still part of the ecosystem. They know how to tend to the ecosystem. We've just forgotten, you know. And part of the healing and the focus on ancestral healing and the caring of self and the caring of each other is to take care of ourselves so that these traumas and dynamics aren't clouding our ability to remember what it means to be part of the ecosystem again and thus take the time to learn. Um, I feel like the only way that our species obviously is going to survive is if we become part of the ecosystem again. And really the need to survive also needs to be freed up because, you know, the will to live at the cost of everything else living, this crazy program that we're in also needs to sh- change, like this healthy relationship with the cycle of life and death, and that, you know, every passing of a life, every death feeds another life. We're just part of this eternal cycle, and that, you know, 
I am food for and nourishment for another life form and that feeling good right. part of the reciprocal flow you know life and creation mm -hmm. I feel like a healthy relationship with death is a big part of it too mm -hmm. to help us release the obsession to live at all costs and the obsession to progress and this like progress obsession against all other things living mm -hmm. I feel like we're having to heal and take care of that and then remember that we're part of an interdependent web of relationships and ecosystem. We're one part in it. Yeah, that's beautiful. Yeah, that's definitely the lesson that needs to be learned and the experience that needs to be integrated. So that's uh... Chief Seattle, I don't know the quote by heart, but he says something like, every small act sends a rippling effect into the web. It's a little different than that, but every small act sends a rippling effect into the web. Um, we, we are all related. We are all related. Whatever we do to the web affects the web and the mindfulness around how we are made of a web of relations. Some of my languaging is in there, but that's really a lot of what Chief Seattle talks about, and I feel like that's a really important message that I'm continuously learning about. I feel like it's a learning that never stops. You know? Yeah, I guess that's how enlightenment works. <laughs> <laughs> and utopia. That, that both are... Constantly a thing to be aspiring to. Right? We can never get there, no matter how far we progress towards it. So, and speaking of which, I guess to wrap up, I know you're a very busy woman and you got a lot of big projects to get back to work on. So thank you again for uh, your time today. This has been an amazing conversation. Uh, and I guess uh, I would love to leave uh, our listeners with like a one paragraph synopsis of your vision of utopia. I guess you've elucidated it pretty clearly in the last answer and in, in many of the answers, but I've been trying to ask uh, all these visionaries that I'm speaking to, like, what are the main points, the main aspects of a society where, you know, you would think, oh, we got there, or it's something that, that's worth trying to work towards, you know? Well, first off, I just want to say thank you for inviting me to be part of this podcast and really deeply appreciate who you are and the purpose of what you're doing here it's so beautiful and i just want to honor it and like bless your journey with it it's already blessed so i just want you to acknowledge the blessing of it yeah it's continual so thank you that's a very big question you know i feel like i have a lot of things to think about and feelings and i have contemplated this for a long time and something i've noticed even from you know in 2001, we drew out our own community, like literally mapped it. In 2019, 18 years later, it's different now from then. And so I feel like part of the utopian society is this acknowledgement of evolution and growth and that things will change. And as we grow, how we care for and tend to and adapt to the changes that we're having, the community's having, the earth is having. It's like an adaptive adapting nature as I feel like an important part of the utopian society mm -hmm. so that we can really allow ourselves to evolve and grow versus resist it. Something that is really important to me now that I imagine for the future is education reform and I'm so sensitive to use this term because I do feel like this term has also been colonized but I am a big fan of the mystery schools from the past and that the kinds of education that we're a part of these mystery schools, older ones, I don't know very many modern day ones that still do that. Um, I feel like I'm in service to recreating at this time. Um, I feel like when we create environment for new educational platforms and thus people's individual intelligence, unique artistic perspective and purpose, um, in the nature of crafting the reality we want to see in the world. Once we start to do that as we're doing that, really the vision of a utopic society that is made up of everyone's vision can unfold because it's multiple perspectives that make it utopic because everyone's included, everyone belongs, everyone has a role. So I'm only one thread, one jewel in the matrix of it. And so I feel like These schools are a beginning for me. You gotta answer that. Man, I could talk about this forever. <laughs> really. Have to have you back on. I would love it. I mean, because now I'm like, after I just said that, there's like 10, 15 other things. From failing speech to telekinesis. These are tales of freedom. to Jolene for the soulful peace. Loss of speech, growth of moss and peach, all of the peoples forgotten like these grown over rocks with mold and rot on old logs. But new growth is reborn in the trees and floors.
his people's languages may have been vanquished in Maya, but they will not vanish. They all exist in creation's expanses higher. Never desist like a patient mantra in ancient mansions, forgotten First Nations and those pacing their lands will one day be an ageless family bonded as one. All we become is authors like the sun's molecules, offering fauna incomparably fostered lore like mythological stories that they were born from waters and creeks, turning into wafting seas from the rivers that gorged them. All of the nymphs of this I one, spirits of Nahuas and shamans, watch over the forests of all of the globe and beyond this. All of the cosmos, colonizing forces, cannot possibly forcefully blot this osmosis of all beings. We are the seams of forgotten dreams, woven together. They create a tapestry of oral traditions, poetic lore, noetically fostered across the centuries, and they are all but a small blink in the rapturously vast expanses of Mother Time and her denizens. Spaceships hop from stars, more ancestors of sky peoples, and cloud beings were forged, lies and deceit cannot flourish in the guises we see and take pride in as beings. Evil Gaijin's needs will not always be prominent. Hegemonic forces will be reconquered by more dominant arising species immortal like the techniques we were taught by the best and meekest of all. We are not carnivorous, it seems. We are omni from potency to presence and prescience. Heaven and hell are within us, but there are many heavens and hells, just as there are many divinities in any being supreme has no need to be called or worshipped as such. We worship Gichi Mani too when the goddesses from dawn to dusk were missing many beauties in our oddity. Existence isn't foolishly wrought. None can barter the worth of the prizes of earth. Rise to your worth and flourish, yet not in the guise of your birth. Constant evolution is the island of immortals, and we are vying towards it with purpose, flying from bottomless gorges to the skies that nurtured and fostered our minds, and our hearse is always, and our hearse is always.